Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Thank you to my colleague, uh, Lainey Velasquez, for preparing and working with our colleagues at um, the Alphand Inn to prepare that cocktail for tonight's happy hour tour. Um, and my name is Dr. Gisela Carbonell. I am the curator at the Rollins Museum of Art. I wonder if you have joined us uh, before or if you're with us for the first time, let us know in comments. And I'm gonna share my screen and pull up some slides. Give me a second to get this. Okay. I hope you can see them fine. If you don't, please let us know. Um, so we are happy to welcome you to our Alphand Happy Hour tour, which we are doing virtual this semester. Um, and as a reminder, the museum is open. So uh, if you want to uh, go to the museum to visit us. We have regular hours and at the Alphand Inn, of course, you can always visit us at the Alphand to see the art. The Alphand is open 24 seven to everyone. You don't need it to be a guest to go and enjoy the art that we have there on display. So I want to give you a brief introduction about the Alphand Inn. And then we're gonna talk about specific works that uh, uh, from the collection that are currently on view at the Inn in celebration of LGBTQ plus history month. Um, so you may be familiar with the Alphand, that's probably why you're here, but I wanted to remind everyone that the works that are on view at the Alphand Inn are part of the collection of the Rollins Museum of Art. And if you haven't visited us or, or um, been in tune with us for, for some time, in recent months, you may notice that we have changed our name. We used to be the Cornell Fine Arts Museum, uh, but now the Rollins Museum of Art. So all the works that we're gonna talk about today are part of the Alphand Collection of Contemporary Art, which is part of the permanent collection of the museum and of Rollins College. Um, our, our collection has a little bit over 5,000 objects. And in the Alphand Collection of Contemporary Art, we have about 500 of those are part of this sub collection that we're gonna talk about today. Our works at the Alphand Inn switch about once a year. So uh, usually in the summer, we rotate works at the Alphand Inn. So hopefully every time you go, you'll get to see something different. Hopefully you go more than once a year to the Inn. Um, and all of the works, of course, in this collection, as well as, as well as in the entirety of our collection are aligned with the curriculum of Rollins College. So as you'll see today, uh, we have works in this collection that speak to uh, the issues that matter to most people today. Um, works by artists from all different kinds of backgrounds, experiences, and perspectives um, from, by artists from different parts of the world of different ethnic backgrounds and uh, who address all sorts of different themes and work in different media. So this is a very global collection that speak to the theme of global citizenship and responsible leadership that uh, is the guiding mission of Rollins College. And so a lot of the works that we uh, include in this collection are those that, reflects, that reflect what we teach in our classrooms at Rollins, but also what we talk about in our daily lives. The themes that most people are talking about uh, in, in current events, issues that are timely, but also timeless. And we're gonna take a look at a few of those objects uh, today. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we're very appreciative of your company. And today I'm sharing with you uh, an image here, a recent image of the lobby, one of the areas in the lobby of the Alphand Inn with um, a couple of works there that are, um, uh, ref that reflect some of these values that we have been talking about. And I want to start our tour officially here with this piece by artist Ugo Rondinone. And uh, this is a piece that I would love to know if you feel like participating and you wanna add some comments in the chat box. I would love to know what, what is the first 
uh, word that comes to mind when you see this work. This is a work that maybe the more you look at it, the more that word choice will change, at least for me. It gives me a first impression that I can describe uh, with two or three words that would probably be very obvious, referring perhaps to the shape and the colors. Um, but I want to know what you think and how you feel when you see this work. It's, it's 31 and a half inches in diameter. It's not a huge piece, but it's very powerful in, in its um, color choices and also in the technique that the artist has used to create it. It's in one of the upper floors at the Alphonse Inn currently. Um, so you can go visit it there and see it up close. Rondinone is an artist who uh, was born in 1964. He was um, born in Switzerland, studied in Vienna in the 1980s and eventually in the 90s moved to um, New York. And he's known for, in part, for uh, a series of what he called target paintings, which are the ones that, uh, like the ones that, that we're seeing on the screen. So um, thank you, Elaine. She says, well-rounded, yes. Um, for me, powerful uh, in visual terms because of the colors, because of the uh, precise choices he's making here with the colors, um, but also it's a little bit hypnotic at least for me, it grabs me and it doesn't let me go. There's something about that combination of colors, the shape of it. Um, and then there's also something a little bit disorienting, right? I feel like, am I, am I look, is there something that's looking at me while I'm looking at the painting? Uh, so these target paintings, he, uh, Rondinone started painting in the 1990s. He also did uh, types, different types of abstract landscape uh, paintings and compositions. And he has done, of course, site-specific installations that you may be familiar with, with um, boulders in different bright, almost neon colors stacked on top of each other in outdoor um, settings in public spaces. But the target paintings, and this one in particular here, or this one as an example, contain, in my opinion, a certain level of, of irony. There are some contrasts that come through in the painting. So when we think about a target, a target is something that is usually precise. It gives you a specific location or a specific area. Think about target, a target in sports or a target in different, uh, in different types of activities where we would use uh, or look at a target. It gives you a definitive location, an area. Uh, it's very precise. However, here Rondinone is creating a target that has no precise lines except for the outer edge of it that contains the actual rings of color. Um, and so the painting, the way in which he applies the painting almost with that spray type technique leaves the edges, the, the, there's no demarcation between the colors except for the colors themselves. So there's a certain blurriness there. There's a boundary that is not completely uh, defined, right? And so it's almost ironic or contradictory that, that this is the way to create the image of a uh, target. Uh, it's very flat, very colorful, very bright. It's almost bold. And the juxtaposition of the colors that he has selected here, uh, the more we look at them, the more they blend. So if you spend a little bit more time looking at that red and the yellow together, you start seeing uh, shades of orange. And same thing if you look at, spend time looking at yellow and focus on the yellow and blue, perhaps you start seeing a little bit of uh, a ring of green right around the outer edge of the blue. So it becomes, it's activated by the viewer to the point that it becomes almost like a neon piece, right? It almost has that effect of being backlit or illuminated. And I love that quality about this work because it's, it's very much how it feels when we see it in person. It's one of those works that 
uh, vibrate, that have that kind of, I can picture the buzzing sound of the neon lights, right? And the, the electricity sort of um, buzzing there in the background. So for Rondinone, uh, this type of work, there is um, an engagement with the viewer through the work that it's very much about the act of looking. It's very much about optics, perception, about the act of looking and taking in what the artist is giving us. Um, but it's also about the act of creation, right? And so when I look at a work like this, I think about the choices the artist has made. The choices that the artist has, has made that are not random, that are not uh, without a rationale, right? That this is a technique that the artist works on um, very thoughtfully and intentionally to create precisely this effect with the viewer in mind, in a way. Um, there's also, and I was uh, reviewing for this talk, some of the criticism and the reviews about Rondinona's work. And I found this article where the, um, an art critic referred to the target paintings by Rondinone as rings of pure sunshine. I think that's a great description for this work. It's just so, so upbeat and so energetic and so bright. And so there's also that idea of transformation. As we were saying, the more we look at it, uh, the more open perhaps we are to finding or noticing different things about the painting. Even though it's so simple, the more time we spend with it, the more we uncover about the technique, about the juxtaposition of colors, about that play with optics and perception. So it encourages also contemplation, right? This is not a work to be looked at quickly. It's a work that invites us to explore it and to consider it from different perspectives. And for Rondinone, there is also a meditative quality about this type of work, not only in creating it, but also in the viewer's engagement with it. And also there is um, a, a kind of thing as a, an act that is transcendental, that there's something meditative um, about creating this work. And there is also a connection between his artistic practice and that of his husband, who was a poet and also a visual artist, John Giorno, whose work we're going to look at in a second. And so in talking about the meditative quality and this kind of connection with uh, our inner being and not just the material, but transcending the material and transcending what we see on the canvas to think about what's behind it or, or where it may take us. I wanted to share this quote with you by the artist that says, I do believe in, spiritual, in the spirituality of art. You don't have to understand art, but you have to feel it. And of course, this is a, um, a statement that uh, reflects and represents Rondinone's perspective. Other artists, of course, may have a very different interpretation of, uh, of, of art as something that needs to be understood or that needs to be unpacked in order to be enjoyed. So Rondinone is putting it out there and saying, you know, you have to feel moved somehow. You have to be provoked emotionally um, to have a reaction, a profound reaction to it. That doesn't mean um, you need to like it or you need to understand it, but it has to move us as viewers somehow to create an impact. There is also a connection here. And so these are some of the layers that I'm trying to peel back uh, by, by considering this work. There is also a connection, of course, to traditions of art making in the 20th century that he is also in dialogue with. Um, uh, through the target painting like this one. We can think about minimalism, we can think about conceptual art, particularly we can think about op art 
and some of the artists who were involved with that, Kenneth Noland and others. The target painting also makes me think about artists such as Jasper Jones, who also uh, explore the, the uh, configuration of the target and in, in famously in some of his paintings. And so there's an engagement here with the tradition uh, of modernist mid-century and, and, and post pop art making um, in the US, but also uh, an engagement with what we consider canonical and the history of art, like some of those artists. And here, what Rondinona is doing is taking those principles, making them his own, and creating something that goes beyond what, uh, what we know of as the creations of these artists to do something that is personal, that involves his own perception, that involves his relationship with his husband, um, their uh, connection to Buddhism, and Zen and all these meditative practices that are very much part uh, of their own personal life. So there's an invitation to look and feel regardless of level of knowledge, look and feel over understanding or over uh, knowing information or knowing historical information. So it's an invitation to, to have a visceral reaction to this type of work and perhaps to sit with it for a little bit and see if we can have a more profound experience and a more profound reaction to it. And I want to draw your attention to the title of the work, which I will not attempt to say out loud because I cannot. But the title of the work, uh, there's something perhaps a little bit playful there, uh, certainly something more banal, a more banal aspect of the work. Uh, because the, um, the title there refers to the date when the work was created. And I think it's uh, 13 April 2016. Um, so it just marks the moment of when the work was created, all spelled out. Um, I believe in German, so I will not attempt to pronounce it. But it's interesting that he is um, spelling the date completely, and that is the title of the work and nothing more. So uh, there is much contained in each of, uh, of the pieces that Rondinone creates. And I think in a way it's up to us how much we want to unpack these pieces, how much we want to contemplate and activate the work. If we just want to appreciate it because of the colors or uh, because it looks like a neon, it's something upbeat and happy and vibrant, that's great. But the more that we um, dig deeper, we find all those other connections um, to the historical context of uh, art in the 20th century, and then to his own uh, personal experience, his relationship with John Giorno and how that um, impacted his own practice and uh, his interest in their personal life and relationship. So I invite you all to visit the Alphonse if you haven't recently. And if you want to take a look at this piece, you can go, I believe it's either, I, I believe it's on the second floor, um, but you can go and see it there. And if you have questions or comments, feel free to put them in the comments and I'll do my best to address them. Then we're going to move to look at a pair of works by John Giorno, who was Ugo Rondinone's um, husband and who unfortunately passed away not too long ago in 2019. So I'll give you a second to read the statements that appear on these works. So Giorno was a poet, a visual artist and an activist. He was born in 1936. Um, and he combines in his work, uh, these two fields of inquiry, these two creative disciplines of art and poetry. And so this combination of text and creating an image with text is very much part of, of his work. His poetry is often, uh, uh, 
very thought provoking. Sometimes some people may say confrontational and it is so intentionally. Um, in some cases, there may be some humor or some way in which he wants to engage uh, with that kind of direct statement with, uh, with the viewer. And it's interesting because we sometimes don't expect that level of directness, right, in a work of art and to see it spelled out in words. And so he's playing with this idea of uh, uh, words represented in visual form and text in visual form to be very bold and uh, direct. And he was uh, in the 20th century, he was part of, uh, at times, part of influential circles in the art world. He was friends with Jasper Johns, who I mentioned when talking about the Target paintings uh, by Rondinone. He was uh, close with Robert Rauschenberg and close with Andy Warhol. And uh, all these relationships, of course, uh, and all these friendships, uh, of course, informed uh, his interests and, uh, and his work. Uh, Jorna was part of Warhol's first uh, feature film uh, that he uh, made in 1963, where he recorded Giorno asleep for hours and hours and hours, and then edited that footage to create a film where you can see Giorno. And uh, in, in this process of getting to know these artists and being part of these circles, he also met um, influential poets who, whose works also informed his own. And so uh, throughout his decades of uh, artistic practice, he became interested in visual form later, started as a, as a poet. But one of the constants of, of his work, of the content, constant uh, connecting thread perhaps of his work is that as, an, as a poet and as an activist, he sought ways to make poetry accessible to regular people, to everyday people very accessible in, uh, in the multiplicity of ways. And that led him to experiment with different techniques, different technologies, um, and different ways of trying to get the word out to people that poetry is accessible, it's for everyone, or it should be for everyone. So that's a characteristic of his work, make poetry uh, something present in everyday context and make poetry available to a wider audience. So he did projects like um, Dial a Poem, which he started doing in 1967, where he uh, collaborated with other poets to record uh, poems that people could listen to when they dial a specific line. Think about that, 1967, you would see um, an announcement with a telephone number you would call the number and you would hear whether it was Giorno or some of the other poets that he worked with and you would hear a recording of a poem. I wish we could have that today, right? Uh, it, it feels like we could use some poetry on the phone uh, today. So listeners would call that number and they would hear that. And I think a few years ago, it may have been when he passed away in 2019, I believe it was the Museum of Modern Art in New York activated one of these lines. I don't know if they still have it or if it was just for a period of time, but I saw it on the museum's uh, um, either social media or website and I called and uh, you could hear the recording. So I, heard, I was able to listen to, um, I believe it was Giorno, it could have been one of the other poets, but reading a poem and so, you could hear the recording, you could hear that sound of not a, not a polished, um, you know, crystal clear recording, but a recording that perhaps marked that era of, of the technology that we had at that time to record. It was, it was a very interesting um, experience. So a year after he started the Dial a Poem project in 19, 1968, he begins uh, making visual works with poetry. So he starts to overlap his two interests, uh, art making and poetry. And finally, in the 1990s, uh, he collaborated with a designer, 
a graphic designer who uh, worked with him to create the, the right font for him to create um, uh, this kind of uh, all caps, very direct, bold uh, type of lettering, like the one that we see here, that is evocative of uh, newspaper headlines or perhaps the headlines that we see sometimes on those uh, banners on TV. It's very clean, very precise, very direct, and to the point where the focus is only the words, right? The focus is only um, on the message. And a lot of his work, uh, like I said, is provocative and it's political. Um, and let's think about for a moment that in the time when he is creating these works, a lot of, of, of his body of work, it's a time when homophobia, for instance, dominated a lot of public discourse, when there's a lot of resistance to accept uh, uh, gay men publicly talking about or having open relationships with other men. Um, and this is the moment in which he uh, becomes very engaged in making efforts to support that community. So he did projects, for instance, to through a foundation to raise money for uh, the AIDS treatment project. So he becomes involved um, through his own practice and his activism with his own community and to support it in, in tangible and concrete ways. And so in his work, and I want us to take a look at these two that we have here, in his work, um, in this uh, series that we have here, he takes uh, fragments of lengthier poems, more elaborate poems that he wrote and decides to represent them here with acrylic on canvas, focusing on just one line. But it's one line that can be read in so many different ways, right? And this is where I think our artists like Brandinone, artists like Giorno are having a dialogue with us consistently and asking us uh, to talk with them, to engage with them, because these works can be read from different perspectives depending on what we bring to them, on what we bring to the conversation and to the table, right? Um, and so it's a different way to experience poetry. And I included this quote here because it illustrates so well uh, where he was coming from when he was doing this type of work. He says, quote, it occurred to me that poetry was 75 years behind painting and sculpture and dance and music, end of quote, right? So he's looking at other uh, ways of, of creating and expressing oneself as being way ahead of poetry. And poetry is something that was perhaps falling behind in his perspective and his view uh, that was perhaps outdated, maybe a little bit obsolete. So here he is taking the traditional idea of poetry and changing it into something that is current and that is relevant in his time and relevant to his experience and that of his own community, right? So the one on the left, we gave a party for the gods and the gods all came. This was from 2012. It's the final um, verse of a poem that is called, I believe it's called High Risque from 1990. So he's revisiting earlier texts for some of his, uh, for some of these works. And then it's not what happens, it's how you handle it from 2014 here part of a poem titled uh, Everyone Gets Lighter, A Meditation on Mortality from 2002. So going back again to earlier uh, writing, to earlier poetry to create these works. These are both on the main uh, level of the Alfondin. So if you want to go view them, you can, uh, they are uh, off of the conservatory at the Alfondin, as if you were walking towards the ballroom, you can see them there. All right, and then here's a work that, like Rondinone, is so bright and bold and colorful and uh, a fantastic painting uh, in the collection. This is by Nicole Eisenman, also on view. This one is um, displayed currently 
in the lounge bar area at the inn. So when you go to get your cocktail, make sure you take a look in the bar area and see it. It has so much nuance in terms of the application of paint, the combination of colors, the vibrancy, the boldness of some of the colors that it really uh, invites us again to contemplate and spend some time looking closely at, uh, at the surface of, of the painting. Uh, Nicole Eisenman was born in France in 1965. She grew up in New York and she lives and, and she lives today and works uh, there as well. She studied art at the Rhode Island School of Design. And Eisenman has received many prestigious awards. I'm not gonna read all of them, but just made a few notes here to give you an idea of her, uh, of her sustained uh, consistent practice throughout the years that, have, that has um, earned her this uh, kind of recognition. In 1996, she was awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship. In 2013, the Carnegie Prize. In 2015, the MacArthur, uh, MacArthur Fellowship. Uh, she has been included in, I believe, three Whitney Biennials across, across the years um, and has shown at many prestigious institutions in the US and abroad. And she's an amazing uh, artist, not only a painter, but also a sculptor. Uh, she showed an incredible uh, uh, installation at the Whitney Biennial in 2019. Um, but this work, Sun in My Eye on the Beach from 2019, is a very personal work, and we are very fortunate to have it in the collection. This is a self-portrait, right? This is a self-portrait. And so very bold, very bright, geometric shapes with flat planes of color, with uh, daring juxtaposition uh, of colors and shapes to create the form here. So it's self-portrait. It's a very different, perhaps unexpected way to think about an artist's self-portrait. And I think in part, what Nicole Eisenman is doing here is acknowledging or maybe nodding to an earlier art historical tradition, particularly Cubism, and all those artists, and it's interesting to think about that from an art historical perspective, right? She's perhaps uh, possibly looking at the artist who began Cubism and who established Cubism as one of the definitive transformational styles of the 20th century. Most of them were men, right? We give credit to you know, Picasso and company. Here, what Nicole Eisenman is doing in the 21st century, looking back at that tradition, is uh, creating her own language that is nodding and, and acknowledging uh, the legacy of Cubism and of those uh, artists. Well, she's creating her own visual language that speaks to her own very personal experience and her very personal relationship to the act of art making. So if we take a look at the painting, uh, the painting is, imagine that you're, uh, able to zoom in, right? So she zooms in the composition to focus on the head. She's not representing her body. She's just focusing on the head. So in the way that it's uh, composed uh, and the way in which she works with uh, the, the planes and the depth and, and the figure, there is an emphasis on monumentality in a way that we are not used to perhaps, right? It looks as if it were a huge um, representation, a monumental representation or depiction of, of the head and face of, of the artist. So the scale is important here to create that effect and it gives it a very solid look, right? And then if we look at uh, the title, when she says, sun in my eye on the beach, take a look at the way in which she has depicted uh, the figure's right eye, right, on our left. There's a ray of sun, of, of sunshine here, literally piercing her eye, perhaps uh, almost blinding her, right, with very bright yellow, right through uh, the figure's eye. And the reference to uh, the ocean, the blue, that band of 
blue in the background and that kind of cloudy sky. It looks like maybe there is a storm happening or, or coming. Uh, the ocean and the sky in the background are a reference to Fire Island, New York, a place that the artist um, is very familiar with. It's a place where she uh, spends many summers, um, has been spending summers for many years. And this is a place where she spends summers with uh, as part of a, a community of artists and curators and art people and other people. Right, so it's a very personal uh, experience for her and it marks her presence in a place that she's very fond of, a specific place, right? So it also marks her existence and her um, being there with, uh, with the painting. So in a way, she is also, uh, when we look at the way in which she is reinterpreting those art traditions that we talked about a moment ago and then in the context where she is living for several months every year um, she's talking about her own experience and she's capturing and giving shape and form to her own experience so a lot of this painting was other works um, in uh, in her practice address or are informed by notions of gender fluidity and gender identity. And so I, um, I am fascinated by the way in which she does that using uh, shape and color here in a way that is very much a in dialogue with the past, but also very much about the present and particularly her present time, her um, current moment, right? So it's an image that is very personal, but that also has or could have, hopefully for others, for viewers and for visitors at the Alphandin, that hopefully has some universal resonance, that it's an image that invites us all to think about our place in the world. It's an image that encourages all to think about how we exist in the world, in our shape, with our own characteristics, in our own context, right? And I included these two quotes by Eisenman here. The first one says, quote, I reflect a certain desire in my work. I want to be authentic and reflective of my body and what it's interested in. The work is nothing if I'm not feeling based end of quote. And then the second one says, I paint because I know the world through my body, end of quote. And I think that's a fantastic way of articulating why this attention to, uh, to the figure, and in particular in this painting, to the head and the face, right? Because this is the way in which she sees the world and she feels the sun um, in her eye on the beach when she's in Fire Island. Let me know what you think about Nicole Eisenman's Sun in My Eye on the Beach. And finally, we have this work. Um, this one is not on view at the Afwandin. This one is currently on view at the museum on campus in an exhibition called um, Art Encounters, Ally is a Verb, is one of four main pieces that we have included in, in that exhibition, all focusing on contemporary artists. So here we have this uh, painting by artist Kobe Mules. This is a work that uh, is a small painting, it's 16 by 26 inches. So it's a work that you have to really get close and spend some time looking at it. So if you have a few seconds, let me know what you think. I have a comment here about Eisenman's work. I'll share it with you. It says Eisenman's portrait feels like looking, looking at a person in the distance from behind abstracted stained glass. I like that. I love how she interplays with color and divides the subject in the negative space and presents them analytically 
while accentuating certain features on the face of, such as the mouth and the nose. I'm gonna go back for a second here because these are really good formal obser observations. I love how she organically represents the clouds and how the band of blue marks the sea and so on. The sun ray touching the eye looks like a finger as if she's personifying the sun too. That's a great reading of that image. Thank you for that, yes. Thank you for that. Yes, and Elaine says, I feel it viscerally, okay. I like it that the art is uh, causing responses, responses, right? From our visitors and our viewers. So this, this uh, painting, as I was saying, is a small painting is in, uh, on view at the museum. And this one is by Kobe Moles. So let me know what you see here. I know we don't have close-ups, but in general, what do you notice here? What, what gets your attention here? This one is uh, titled, actually it's untitled Playground from 2009. And it's an oil on canvas. And I, as I said, it's quite small. So the viewing experience has to be close up. It's a very intimate experience. So uh, Kobe Moles here appears 16 times, I believe, about 12, 16 times in this uh, painting. And each time he appears is the same representation, wearing the same clothes, same haircut, same shoes. The only thing that changes is the pose, right? Sometimes we see him as a young boy by himself, other times um, interacting with other, another version of himself in this uh, outdoor playground. Uh, it's a form of self-portraiture, but that is certainly not the traditional uh, self-portraiture that uh, perhaps we think about. Uh, Moles started painting when he was very young and uh, eventually went to art school and earned an MFA from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And in his work, he combines personal experience, as most of these artists do, but also in dialogue um, with the art historical tradition and the art historical canon. And in this work, we see the relationship between the individual, the relationship between the artist himself here as a young person and nature. And that is significant, significant because particularly because of the artist's own uh, upbringing and uh, the struggles and the transformations that he has experienced in his life and how that has changed uh, his relationships uh, with family members and also his, uh, the perception of, of himself. So he is a transgender male who was uh, brought up in a very conservative religious family in rural California. And he talks about growing up and the experience of nature with his family as a young uh, child and how that perception has changed the memories uh, that he has spending time in nature with his family. So in this case, uh, and of course, growing up and uh, acknowledging his own identity and his own presence in the world affected and changed perhaps some of the relationships with his family. Um, and so in this work, uh, he's looking at ways in which nature is traditionally represented, particularly he's looking at uh, representations of nature in Hudson River school paintings. So that, that tradition of 19th century uh, depictions of nature and the idea or notion of the sublime that nature is overpowering and that human beings are tiny and powerless in its, uh, in, in its midst, that, uh, that nature is a force to reckon with and that humans are powerless. Uh, perhaps, but at the same time in awe uh, of its beauty, right? So that kind of conflict of, of uh, feelings and emotions and experiences. And so here, uh, Moules depicts this playground um, in, in the landscape outside in nature. 
And it's a way in which he is uh, asserting his presence in this landscape that also has perhaps some spiritual and uh, religious connotations or connections through nature, to, to spirituality, to um, a spiritual presence, right? So here he's asserting his presence in that context, his own identity in that context. And so he is in a way uh, reclaiming natural spaces um, as his own and feeling them with multitude of himself, of his presence in this natural environment and uh, in the world. And so, yes, I have, there's a comment here. The handstand is so freeing. The shadows of the trees point to the sunnier areas. True, and those shadows create very interesting shapes. They're a little bit um, perhaps ominous, right? Some of them are pointy, maybe a little bit scary, but they're kind of uh, to the side. So we don't see the foliage that's creating those shadows. Um, but yes, the handstand, some of these poses look very playful. Um, but then I, I wonder about in the foreground where we see uh, the young child sitting there by himself, um, looking down perhaps in that self-reflection, um, lonely. Um, there's also on the right, in the very background, there's a picnic table and you can see him sitting on the table, just being there by himself, looking at other versions of himself playing um, on the playground. So. Um, there's a, a series of, of paintings similar to this one that Moles has been working on for several years where he depicts uh, self-portraits that are uh, multiples in one image, right? And so it's, again, another one of these works that the more we look at it, uh, the more we uncover and the more points of connections of connection we find. And the quote here by the artist says, quote, the religious voices of my past use nature against the validation of my existence. Look how powerful those words are. The religious voices of my past use nature against the validation of my existence. By overwhelming these spaces with my presence, I am shifting the weight within these spaces and creating a community of me playing, exploring myself, exploring nature, and being part of it. So the level of, of self-awareness and intentionality in these paintings responds to this, uh, to his own experience and responds at the same time to a history that has enabled or has created the environment in which people like Kobe Mool sometimes feel lonely or are left alone, behind, overlooked, not seen, right? So his painting is a celebration of this um, moment of asserting his presence in the world and his existence, but also a reminder to all of us, right? Uh, to think about uh, the experiences of those who may have had similar situations like moles or ourselves, if we have been in those uh, experiences ourselves. Let me know what you think and what what about this painting grabs your attention. Uh, the handstand stays with me. I know Elaine commented on that. If, if you have a another uh, area of this particular painting or another element of the painting that sort of grabs your attention, let me know. And this work, the exhibition that it's a part of at the moment uh, is an exhibition about allyship. So it's, it's a perfect uh, piece to have conversations about uh, the experiences of those like Kobe Moles and uh, the experiences of others who can be uh, or can become allies in this conversation. And finally, uh, before I take any questions or comments and feel free to share those, I wanted to remind you uh, that we have three volumes of uh, the catalogs of the Alphen Collection of Contemporary Art already published. 
some of the artists that we have discussed tonight are included in volumes one, two, or three. Um, others like uh, Nicole Eisenman, that work is so recent that uh, that one will be included in volume four, which will be coming out at some point in the near future. But the first three are available and you can find uh, more information about the artists and about the specific works that are in the Alton collection in these three volumes. Um, and the catalogs, of course, are available in the museum store. Uh, they also have them at the Alphonse Inn if you just want to go and, and flip, flip through the pages and, um, and take a look. You can do that, of course. And there's a lot of information on our website. I included the um, web page there if you want to visit our website. Also information about the specific works and also about the specific artists. So I hope that um, looking at these uh, works together today give you a sense for uh, how we talk about some of these artists in our collection, the kinds of conversations that we hope to have with our visitors, the dialogues that come up when we think about the artist experience and the artist's cr uh, creative output and how it resonates with us all, right? And I love that this group of artists, the selection that we made for tonight, we have artists from different backgrounds, different age groups, different life experiences, different gender identities, right? And how each of them brings something valuable and important to the table. And so I hope that when you visit the Alphonse and when you visit the museum, take some time to look at the work. And uh, there's always lots of information that we provide with the artwork um, and think about some of these uh, connections. So let me know if you have any questions. Lainey, I don't know if we have questions from Facebook. I don't questions. believe so. Um, okay. However, I did wanna um, just make a comment about the uh, work, um, Mule's work, because I think I really love it for two reasons. One that um, I feel like LGBT people are often depicted in, in society as in a negative way, usually in some kind of sexualized content. So I think seeing this is interesting because it's it's a playground and it's very innocent and it's that, that reclaiming of innocence. But then on the other hand, um, I really like it because that is where a lot of people, I feel like start to build their gender identity. I can remember growing up and, and there was like, the girls playing over here and they wanted to play, you know, house. And then there were the boys over here and they wanted to play soccer or kickball. So it's a place where I feel like a lot of children start to mold their gender identity. And being that we've, we've kind of been operating on this binary for quite some time now, um, <laughs> there, there's always that divide. And I know as, as a part of the community myself, that was always a very confusing time because well, I hated kickball and I didn't want to play house. So I usually found something else to do like read books and things but it's just a very interesting part of I think growing up um, gay or LGBT in general that you don't typically see I think in in his, the historical art canon is is this um, very personal look of of people's lives as children because I mean we, we all grow up we're all children you know at some point so I just thought that was interesting that's it. Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, way of thinking about it and looking at it that, you know, um, these in, in the case of Kobe Moles and the, the metaphor of the playground as that moment early in life when there are choices being made right for for us when we are kids um, by society, by parents, by religion, by right. And then as you grow up, uh, that's something that you have to grapple with. Um, so yeah it's 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 very interesting how how these ideas and these notions come up in some of um kobe mool's work and focusing as you said i agree with your with your observation in this early stage right mm -hmm. um when maybe we're not thinking about that as much there's a comment from facebook let's see in mool's work i admire how the artist depicted his child self in clothing with similar colors to that of the playground pieces as, as if he is at peace and one with the playground and the environment. This work moves me and reminds me that one must remain strong and confident in a world of twists and turns, and that the only way through life's problems is to go through them, or in this case, to play along with them. 
so we could survive and shine through. Thank you for sharing these pieces. Thank you for, for your comments. Um, I wonder if you're an art historian because it sounds like you are right on point with, with your analysis and, um, and identifying the meaning in a lot of these elements. And I appreciate so much uh, your words. And I think that's a great, great way to end this tour with, with your words. So thank you for joining us tonight and for sharing your thoughts. Um, if we don't have any other questions or comments, I think we're about time. So with that, I very soon at the Altondin and very soon at the museum, visit us on our website, rawlins.edu slash RMA and have a great night, everyone. Thank you for joining. <laughs>